I'm Sharon Bill, welcome to my YouTube channel. I thought it'd be a good idea to just jump into the new year and tackle some subjects head on and I'd like to chat about the instruments of the orchestra. If it is that, for example, you just play piano, it's unlikely you come across these different instrument groups and if you do play another instrument, you usually tend to stay within your own instrumental group and miss out on what's going on in the other instruments of the orchestra. So unless you actually play in an orchestra, some of these instruments can be a little bit of a um, confusion to us and for grades four and five theory you need to know a little bit about the orchestra and for grades six seven and eight you definitely need to know about the orchestra however even if it is that you're not studying music theory it's really good to understand the different characteristics of the instruments and the instrumental families because very often we play in arrangements that we need to replicate the sort of the mood and the character of the different instruments so I thought we'd just have a little chat through the instruments of the orchestra and how it all sort of fits together and I'll just sort of work my way through now I've only got a few little stick it notes here and other than that I'm just going to keep chatting so it's highly likely I'll get a little bit carried away so if you want to press pause and go and get a brew and come back and then you can perhaps just dig into this delicious subject with me. So we have the orchestra here and it's always set out in a particular way so the conductor knows exactly where the instrumental groups are. People often think that the conductor is a little bit redundant but honestly without this uh, conductor beating time it's really difficult. The orchestra would just start to disintegrate really. They really do hold it all together um, so they are a vital part the complete glue that holds it all together and it's always set out in this way and on a, a score the score that the conductor would be reading the instruments of the orchestra are always set out in the same way starting with the highest of the woodwind right the way down working your way through to the strings at the bottom so it's always in that same kind of layout so you know where to look to find the different instruments so let's start with the string family. Now the highest of the string family is the violin which I think we're all pretty familiar with and then after that comes down to the ch the, vi the viola. I was skipping ahead to the cello then and the viola is very similar to the violin except it's a slightly bigger instrument, it's a deeper range and it's the viola that uses the alto clef. Now I mentioned and you do need to know for your theory which clefs and which instrument ranges uh, the instruments use and I've given you a brief little guide to that in my free PDF so if you go to my website it's grade 4 section L on the information sheets and you can find out the general information there but I'm just going to kind of pad that out because I think sometimes you study this as a bit of an abstract dry kind of exercise whereas if we can kind of bring these to life a little bit more and make them a bit more memorable and I'm very much a visual learner so if we can see them and if we can hear them you've got a much more um, thorough chance of getting to grips with these instruments so the violin's the highest then it's the viola which uses the alto clef and then next is uh, the cello now I've got a little note here and that's reminded me if you want a general overview of the orchestral instruments. There are things like Peter and the Wolf by Prokofiev or Bren, um, Benjamin Britten's Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. They give you an overview of all the instruments in the orchestra and to a lesser degree there's uh, Ravel's Bolero and it, just a little note about that. I remember hearing Bolero for the first time when I was about 14. I'm going to give my age away here, not that I'm, I mind, I'm not ashamed of it. And um, I remember watching as a teenager Torval and Dean with their world championship winning ice skating dance to Ravel's Bolero and I remember it's one of those life changing moments when I was just so captivated by the beauty of the music and also the beauty of the the ice skating routine that they did it, it still brings me to tears now and I've put a link to most of the music I'm going to be referring to 
so that you can hear what it is that we're talking about. And for Ravel Bolero, I've also I've made sure I've put the clip to the Ravel um, Bolero tune, of course, but with Torville and Dean's ice skating dance that won them the world championships. So it, yes, of course you can listen to these general guides, but I do think it's much more helpful to get a, a more microscopic idea of the instrument. And so for the cello, of course there's um, Elgar's cello concerto, but my personal favourite is the Bach Suite in D, the Prelude, and I've put a link to that, it's just sublime. The cello is a beautiful instrument. So the cello, um, often uses the bass clef, but it also uses the tenor clef as well. And we have to have these different clefs because otherwise we'd be kind of with loads and loads of ledger lines and it's sort of mid range. And that's why we use that other clef. Uh, and then of course you've got the double bass, which uh, transposes down an octave. That's something you need to know. So whatever you read on the music, the sound is actually an octave lower. It's such a massive, massive instrument. And I've popped here as well the harp. It's not really part of the string family in that orchestral general sense, but it does appear in orchestras at times. And it's um, definitely got its place in the orchestra, but not perhaps in the sort of the throngs of the string section as it were. So now we're moving on to the woodwind section. So that's basically uh, instruments that you blow that aren't brass. And so we start at the top with the flute and the piccolo. And uh, the piccolo, you need to be aware, transposes an octave higher than written. So the, the flute is as written, the piccolo is an octave higher. And if you want to have a listen to an example of the flute, uh, one of my favourites, it's kind of a little bit strange, it's a bit of a fruity one, it's Debussy, so it's going to be a little bit impressionistic, but it's the syrinx, it's absolutely beautiful. And the link that I've put for you to listen to is, of course, the master himself, James Galway, playing that. And so that's the flute. After that we have the clarinet and the bass clarinet. So the clarinet is in B flat, it's a transposing instrument, so when it plays a C, it sounds a B flat, it's a single reed instrument, so you've got the mouthpiece of the clarinet and then just one reed, and you blow between that and it's the vibrations between the mouthpiece and the reed that create the sound. It's a beautiful instrument and I'm sure everybody knows Mozart's Clarinet Concerto, the second movement. I've put a link to that and I've put the one played by Emma Johnson purely because back in my student days, I did interview Emma Johnson. She was kind of at the height of her career then. I felt very honoured to be in her presence. And I wrote a little article on her for one of my, was it my degree topics or my HND, something like that. I think it might have been my HND. I think she might have been at Keele University. I can't remember where she was now. Anyway, I feel very chuffed to have met her and spoken to her and done a brief little, I must have been so naive. I wouldn't, I dread to think now the questions I asked her. I'm sure I've got the essay somewhere, but um, I think it's probably buried away. So uh, have a listen to the clarinet concerto. That gives you a, a marvellous ex example of the beautiful lyrical qualities of the clarinet. Of course, it can play jolly pieces too, but that is the epitome of clarinet. Then we have the oboe. Now the oboe, it's a, not a transposing instrument, but it is a double reed instrument. So instead of having a mouth, mouthpiece, you've got two reeds kind of bound together and you blow between those. And it's a really tricky instrument to play. I think you have to really control your breathing because it's such a tiny aperture to blow through. And it can sound truly awful until you've mastered it and then it becomes so beautiful, so divine. Now I've put as examples that you might want to listen to, of course, it's the Mozart Oboe Concerto in C, the second movement, that is beautiful. I remember first hearing that when I watched um, the movie Amadeus and I think that sounded, and it was just a real kind of caricature of Mozart's character because here is this beautifully sublime 
music, whilst at the time Mozart himself was acting like a complete buffoon, he was a real extreme character, and so that was a really telling sort of juxtaposition, to use the artistic term, of Mozart with his beautiful musical genius, and then his kind of really comic character at times. However, if you want something a little bit more modern, I would say, there is the soundtrack to The Mission uh, by, the music was by Ennio Morricone. I've mentioned him before, I remember hearing this, it's called Gabriel's Oboe. I've never watched the film, it's too heart-wrenching. But the music is just, it, it was one, another one of those life-changing moments when I heard that piece of music. So I've included that because I can't think of the oboe without thinking of that piece. So moving on, I'm trying to be really quick here because I'm just going to get so carried away. It's such a captivating topic. Related to the oboe is the cor anglais. That literally just means the English horn. And that's a little bit confusing because we think of horn as a brass instrument. However, the English horn is a double reed instrument, and so the aperture is just like the oboe. It's related to the oboe, but it's definitely got its own characteristics, and that's a transposing instrument, so it's an F. So it plays a C, but sounds an F. And on many of these transposing instruments, I'm saying oh, it's in this key, but there are very often many different tuning so there isn't always just one clarinet you can have clarinet in a um, you can have the bass clarinet which transposes an octave lower again um, and so like the cor anglais is in f but many of these instruments there are different tunings as well there isn't just one so do look out on the score to see which one it is because it could be a different tuning and then we have the characteristic bassoon uh, which again is a double reed instrument and then we have the double bassoon which transposes an octave lower and these make up the lowest of the woodwind section and for this uncharacteristically I've chosen an arrangement and it's a Debussy piece Le Fille aux Cheveux de Lain, a terrible French accent there and it means the girl with the flaxen hair and it's actually a piano piece but what I've included for you to listen to here is actually for bassoon and harp and I just think it's a really beautiful clever arrangement and it shows the um, beauty of the bassoon we often think of it as a quirky kind of instrument whereas actually this is really beautiful and lyrical and it also shows the um, range of the harp as well I think the harp's one of the few instruments like the piano that's just got such a massive range and it's such a vast range to cover so um, that's the bassoon as well and that marks the end of the woodwind section so now we come to the brass section so again you blow it but it's usually a metal uh, instrument and it's usually denoted by the fact that it's got like a, a certain mouthpiece and the trumpet is the highest of that and that's a transposing instrument it's in B flat the um, brass band alternative to that is the cornet it's the trumpet the orchestral version um, so that's that we have uh, the French horn and this is, I think, notoriously difficult to play. I do think that perhaps brass is the trickiest to play because you're playing by valves and you're playing on harmonics. So as you click the valves, I'm sure you don't click a valve, you press it. I don't play brass, that might just be apparent now. But as you play with a valve, it just sort of jumps which scale, which harmonic pattern you're in and you're playing by jumping through variants of harmonics. After that, it's far too mathematical and technical for me. So you've got to have an amazing sense of pitch, I think, because you could be playing something and it'll sound like you're playing it exactly right, and then you find out you're in completely the wrong key, you need like a third too high or something. So, uh, yeah, I think I'll just stop there because I'm out of my depth. However, the French horn is a transposing instrument. Horns tend to be a transposing instrument down to F, However, again, in many cases, there are alternatives. 
And I think the perfect example for this is Mozart's Horn Concerto in E flat. Anyway, moving on, because I'm going to be way too long if I keep going. The trombone. I remember my uncle. No, my uncle. Yeah, my uncle and my cousin played trombone. And I think it's a really beautiful instrument. It's very, very versatile. And again, it's one of those that changes clefs. So by all means, do refer to the PDF here. You can see, you know, it usually tends towards the bass clef, though it can use other clefs as well. So just keep your eyes open if you're reading a score for that. The tuba is the lowest of the orchestral brass family. There is a bass tuba as well, and very, very rarely does it play a part as a solo instrument, although actually it can be a very, very... Um, dexterous instrument if you are clever at it. I know my friend's done some accompaniments for a tuba recital which was um, yeah very interesting really. So you know don't just resign it to the back bench as it were. It is an instrument in its own right but in an orchestral setting it doesn't tend to get solo passages as such. And then this brings us finally to the percussion section which is a shame. The poor percussionists always seem to come last. My son's a percussionist and uh, I always think percussion gets a bit of a bad rap. It, you think it's the easy bit because you just kind of bash it. In actual fact, it's really, really difficult and you have to do so much. It's really stressful. You know, you're jumping around from this to that, to this to that, and you've got to be able to read music and you've got to be able to read uh, percussion notation as well. And it's divided into two sections. We've got tuned, and untuned, or we would say definite pitch and indefinite pitch. So for example here we can see the um, the gong, which is untuned, you just bash it and it creates a sound, <laughs> and the triangle, similar, uh, on a much lighter scale, and it's terrible in orchestral music where you can see like you've got 37 bars rest, and then this terrifying crash of the gong, which must be so stressful, and there's lots of YouTube uh, examples of where perhaps the percussionists got it terribly wrong. And then you've got tuned percussion, so they are untuned, and then you've got the tube percussion, which is most obvious in things like the tubular bells. You can see as the tubes get shorter like or longer like, um, like a pipe organ pipe, that's what's going to give you your pitch, the change in the length of the tube. And basically that's what you're doing when you're playing, for example, a flute. You're just using your fingering to create a longer or a shorter tube. That's what your fingering's doing, basically. And so um, the glockenspiel is another version of tuned percussion. And you've got bad memories of glockenspiel. Well, I certainly have. Um, from school and here's a, a lesson in life. I remember I'd be about five or six and I was given the glockenspiel part. I mean it can't have been much of a part at that age and I got such a dreadful sense of timing at that point, I must have just worked through it, that the teacher had to sit behind and tap my foot. I was kneeling on the floor and she had to tap my foot whenever it was my turn to play because I just couldn't get it at all. So uh, there we go. That didn't stop me though. I kept persevering and I've managed to count to four since then. And I've put for the example of this, um, Simone Ribello playing Flying Mallets. And I've chosen this one played by her. She was a student of the famous percussionist who was deaf, Evelyn Glenny. And I've chosen her because actually I've sort of met her on a few occasions. Once was years and years and years ago when she performed in our choir concert and she played a piece very similar to this. It may have been this actual piece, but it was certainly as impressive if it wasn't this one. And so she performed as the soloist for us in one of our concerts at the Victoria Hall in Hanley. And then years and years later, I wonder what effect that had, because then my son later went to the Royal Northern and he also met her there as a percussionist. So that's quite a little story there. And then I've included here as well a picture of the timpani or the kettle drums because I think this is a really confusing one because it looks like it should be untuned or indefinite pitch. 
because you just kind of hit it but that's not so it's tuned percussion and it tends to be tuned to something like the tonic and the dominant notes of the scale um, and I know my son's played that on many occasions and it's really stressful I think because it, if you haven't got lots and lots of timps but you need to keep changing note the percussionist the poor percussionist has to keep tuning it kind of tapping away quietly whilst the orchestra is going and uh, to then tune to change the note to then tune it back to then play the other note to then tune it back it just sounds terrifying so the timps are tuned and I've put for as an example for that well I've put two examples one seems a strange choice it's the Beethoven violin concerto so by all means you can listen to that as an exercise in what the violin is but I've also given that because it starts with a really distinctive just the first three beats and nothing but timps and it's really dramatic entrance so uh, I've put that and then I've also included Holst uh, Mars from the planets Mars the bringer of war because in that there are six timps playing so there are two performers I think playing six timps throughout that and you can hear the dramatic effect of the timps in Mars from the planet by Holst. So that is a massive whistle stop guide tour through the instruments of the orchestra and I really hope that that helps you to just get a glimpse of it and by all means you follow the rabbit runs down and just really kind of explore what the orchestral instruments have to offer and so if you are answering some questions on your theory about the instruments of the orchestra hopefully if this video can help you bring images and sounds to mind it's less of a, a dry exercise and it's more meaningful it's also more enjoyable I think and if it is that you're playing a piece of music that should be for a different instrument at least then you've got some idea of the tonal qualities or the timbre you would say of what each of these instruments are and what it is that you're trying to capture and play again on a separate instrument. So I do hope that's helpful to you. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.